Welcome to Schweitzer Drive, a podcast where we explore what goes on between the generation of electricity and the light switch. Join Dave Whitehead as he interviews the entrepreneurs, innovators, and experts who are inventing the future of electric power. The electric power grid is considered to be the largest man-made machine ever created. It's vast, complex, and essential to modern life. And as it continues to evolve to serve more people and industries and to accommodate new challenges, it will require a steady pipeline of smart, well-educated people to invent, design, build, operate, and secure the power system of the future. In this episode, we're going to talk about how we can fill the talent pipeline and find the next Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, and one of my favorites, Dr. Ed Schweitzer. My guest today is John Castleman, SEL's K-12 Outreach Manager. John runs numerous programs and manages dozens of events each year that are aimed at getting kids excited about STEM. In an average year, John, with the help of SEL engineers and other volunteers throughout the company, engages with more than 2,000 K-12 students here in the Northwest and other locations. John began his career as a middle and high school teacher. He earned both a BA in history and a BA in communications from Washington State University. He also holds a master's in teaching from uh, Seattle University. He has served on the board of directors at Schools Out Washington and the Palouse Discovery Science Center. He currently chairs the board of trustees of Pullman Community Montessori, the newest charter school on the Palouse. Hi, John. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me. Hi, Dave. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. First, let's talk about metrics. In our last episode, I mentioned some pretty significant statistics. Research has shown that up to 30% of the folks working in the electric power industry will be ready to retire in the next decade, with 10% who are ready to retire now and another 11% within the next one to five years. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, by 2026, the shortage of engineers in the U.S. will exceed 1.2 million folks. This feels kind of bleak. Where are we going to get the well-educated, creative inventors and problem solvers that I mentioned in the intro, John? Yeah, it does feel bleak. And the electric power industry is not an anomaly in the broader STEM industry. But I think there are a lot of reasons to hope. I think the next generation of innovators and problem solvers is going to come from everywhere from the pre-K kids in childcare centers to adults who have just now and later in adulthood found their passion are returning to school to become engineers because they finally found that thing that they're really excited about. Um, So I think all across the communities in this country, we're going to find them. So I want to dig into that a little bit further, but before we go there, will you talk a little bit about your job and why SEL and other companies would invest in K through 12 outreach programs? My job boils down to connecting community partners like schools, libraries, other nonprofits to SEL and our resources, like our engineers, like our technicians, other volunteers, um, could be our equipment, could be our places. So what that looks like in practice is going to a school STEM night. It might be hosting large events here, sending engineers into classrooms to speak with students there, hosting students here for field trips working with teachers on professional development. So there there are a wide variety of things we do, but what it comes down to is creating more opportunities for kids, for students in STEM. Let's let's talk about STEM for a little bit. So when I think of STEM, you know, I'm a, a essentially a hiring manager and I I think I need engineers and scientists and other folks, you know, uh, uh skilled in the in the the arts of of STEM. And I usually quickly go to What am I getting out of colleges around here, whether it's Washington State University, U of I, or or many others around the the U.S. or or, or the world? And uh, certainly your your title is K through 12. Um, We're talking about STEM activities and and trying to get kids excited, whether, you know, boys, girls, whoever it might be, uh, to really go into the the mathematics or the science or, or, or the technology. Where... Where is the right place to start or be concerned? I mean, you you mentioned kindergartners, and is that is it too late even at kindergarten, or is it too soon? What what are your what are your thoughts there? I don't think it's ever too early, and I don't think it's ever too late. But I think it is important for us to think about where can we get the best return on investment, or where, where are the ideal times? And I think one of those times is before they even get to kindergarten, where we as a community, as a society, need to support 
helping students or children birth to three years old, get access to nutrition, have opportunities to learn some basic things like pat- pattern recognition. And once they get into school, I think once they start to get in kindergarten, we start introducing them to what's possible, what's out there. We're not trying to tell a kindergartner that they need to be an engineer, mm-hmm. but we can give them more opportunities to problem solve with their hands. We can get them thinking about how they want to change the world and make an impact on the world. Once you get to middle school and into early high school, though, we do start to see students who have built their identities and have this idea of what they can and can't do. And so really, we do start to lose them in a sense um, in their sophomore, juniors of high school where they've decided, hey, I can or can't do this. All that said, I've talked to people who have gone well past high school, college, and are coming back because they found that engineering, this way of problem solving is something that they enjoy and are coming back as non-traditional students. That's the the term that they use for students who are not in that 18 to 22 year old age range have to come back and and pursue those those dreams that they've put off for so long. In the uh in uh, some of the statistics we ju- we just talked about where we see a, a 1.2 million person deficit for our, our, our STEM uh, vocations, what do you think are the contributors for kids not wanting to, to go into, well, the, the STEM vocations? Is it, it's too hard, it's not fun, it's boring, I'm going to sit at a desk or, or is it something else? Yeah, it's, it is those things. I would boil it down to three. I think one, it is self-perception that students don't go into STEM fields because they think it's going to be too hard or engineering is just math and I'm not good at math, so I'm not going to do that. I think another piece of it is awareness, um, knowing what careers exist. I mean, there are, there are thousands, tens of thousands, maybe more types of careers out there. There's no way we can teach students about every single type. Um, but I think there's a big opportunity to talk about goals, the goals of a particular profession. So engineer, it's a, engineers, so much of it is about using math and science to make the world a better place in a very tangible way. I think if you present that to students as what engineering is about, as opposed to, yeah, engineering's math, um, then you're going to get a lot more students. And then the third is just the number of opportunities that are out there. And that's something that we see and hear in our local communities where they say there's just not they're just not STEM programs here. I don't know. They'll, we've, we've got folks who come from outlying communities to Lewiston or to Pullman and say that this just doesn't exist here. We're looking for something. We need something. My kid's really good at problem solving. They enjoy taking things apart, but it's just that lack of opportunity that is a barrier to filling that gap. And I think that all of the things I mentioned, perception, awareness, and opportunities are all solvable problems. Another thing that's changed is how students decide what they want to do. Generations ago, it was about having a stable income, having good benefits, being able to provide for one's family. If you had those things, you were set. People now are looking for, how am I impacting the world? What kind of values does this company have? And I think when we're talking about these grand challenges like maintaining and building an electrical grid, I think that's one of those challenges that many students will rise to if they know that's the challenge in front of them. When you think about how their access to energy has such an impact on an individual, um, on a nation, that, that that becomes one of those grand challenges. I think COVID will be one of those things that's going to inspire a lot of future STEM professionals and innovators to pursue degrees and careers in health. I think with this rise in renewable energy and um, considering things like electric cars and this increased demand that we'll have on the grid, that's going to be an inciting factor for students to pursue engineering, manufacturing, and other. Are are you starting to see that now when when you go out and visit kids? Just, you know, it's a, it, it's an interesting thought, right? There are a lot of problems that, that we're facing, whether you talk about uh, climate change or green energy and all, all of these things, you mentioned the pandemic and, 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 and what have you. So all of these require STEM, STEM STEM-based skills to to, to solve. And so is that going to be inspiration enough for for these K through 12 folks to to get inspired to go take that calculus or go take that physics class or chemistry class so that they can be part of these these grand challenges we have as a a nation and as a world? 
Yes. Yeah, I think so. Um, a lot of the conversations that I have with folks that are part of regional efforts, um, st- you know, STEM groups, uh, STEM ecosystems, that's one of the things that they're really pushing in these career pathway programs is not to say, hey, single student, because you're good at math and science, you should become an engineer. There's a long runway for them to get to an engineer from from kindergarten or from fifth grade. So instead of saying, hey, here's what an engineer does and here are the particular things that you must be good at to become an engineer, instead by saying, hey, here's the challenge you need to solve and here's the things that you're good at that match well with that challenge. I think aligning that interest and that innate ability with some of these grand challenges is part of the key. And that way, students stop seeing themselves as, yes, I can be an engineer or no, I can't. And instead, like you were just saying, say, all right, I'm not great at math, but if calculus will help me be a better engineer. I'm going to do that because that end goal is more important. That helping the world is more important than my dislike for math. So I'm going to do it. What do you think has changed, say, from now to, to, to 40 years ago when it comes to, to STEM? Because I can, I can probably make an argument. I went into a, a STEM field eventually. I didn't, didn't think I was going to end up here when I was in junior high or, or even most of high school. Um, and, then, and then you look at perhaps the opportunities that, that I had right growing up and I ended up in a STEM field and you look at it, why, you know, this big deficit we have for, for STEM jobs going unfulfilled right now. Uh, do you see differences? Is, is there something that's changing at either the school level or society wise that would take people out of STEM or something like that? seems like we got to, or maybe we just have more STEM jobs that, that need to go fulfilled kind of thing. We still are producing about the same number of, of STEM folks, if you will, but the number of jobs are just increasing and increasing and increasing. Yeah, I think that is part of it. I think there are just many more jobs that are STEM jobs, more problems in that digital space, for example, in computer science, cybersecurity. Those are jobs that did not exist 40 years ago. But I think there are some other things that have maybe not changed, but but that have certainly influenced what we're talking about. I think one of those is standardized testing This idea that you've got to have a particular answer to a particular question and that we're going to teach to that. I think part of it, too, is that we're perhaps less interdisciplinary, that math means math, science means science. There are separate things when in reality our brains take in and solve problems using a variety of different mechanisms and tools and disciplines. And so because of that compartmentalization, because of that focus on standards, I think to some degree, we are losing that ability to see a problem to be solved and using whatever tools necessary to solve it and more going back to, oh, I I need math to solve that, but I'm not good at math. So the door is closed. I'm done with it. How do you balance that, though? Because I I could probably make an argument that is, well, to solve an engineering problem, first, I need to understand the math. Then I take the math, I can apply it to a physical problem. And then the physical problem, I can actually go solve a particular problem in in, in my discipline. So I can I can appreciate, yeah, they're, they're, they're different disciplines, but I, I struggle, I guess, to see it's like a, it's a blended glob of, of stuff, right? It's like, I don't know how to do one before I can do the other. But, you know, it's like you got to learn how to walk before you can run, before you can, I guess, sprint or something. So <laughs> to use some, some, some bad uh, analogies. But I, I think that analogy works, and I, I do think you're right. Um, what I'm saying is less that we need to create this blob and more make students aware that that these rigid barriers between the disciplines are permeable. I think we need to convey to students that, yes, these are discrete tools, that algebra is a discrete tool, and the scientific process is a discrete tool, but that you can combine those and you can add in your art, you can add in your writing, right? Make something, you know, that's, uh, that is why we have a marketing department here at SEL is to show maybe a wider audience, the importance of electric power. When we're talking about students' perceptions of these things, I think it is precisely because these different disciplines have been so sectioned off that we're losing that ability to be creative in our problem solving. I, I, I think I get what you're saying, right? It, it can probably come back to, let's use an iPhone as an example, right? It's a, it's an elegant tool for solving a lot of different problems from surfing the the web to reading the Wall Street Journal in the morning to answering emails. But there is a lot of tech now. There's a lot of math that goes in behind. There's a lot of computer science that goes behind it, right? But it's it's a blending of, of arts and sciences and, and what have you. Maybe that's what you're trying to get at. It's not just algebra in isolation or, you know, physics 
an isolation rather it's 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 a it's a balance of many different disciplines right that go to to creating an iphone or creating a digital relay or or some other stuff that we might be doing here at, at sel mm-hmm. yeah and one other thing i would add to that too is that as society specializes that i think lends itself to more of this sectioning off that you must be a pro in this area or you will not succeed. And, and I guess one example of that, um, I remember one time I was looking at a job posting here, at SEL for an engineer position. And one of the first things was, you know, requires a, a bachelor of science in engineering or equivalent experience. And my mind was blown. And so I go call up HR and said, wait a second, you're telling me that you can get a job as an engineer with equivalent experience. Like, what does that mean? I think that openness that SEL has is the right way to solve the problem because it's not saying that hey, you, the end, this engineering degree is the thing that's going to help you solve problems. It's not just that. It's if you can solve the problem, we want you. So I think so many people have got, especially students have got this in their head that, oh, I need to have a 4.0 in math to be an engineer, as opposed to thinking, hey, math is a tool. I'll use it, but really engineering is about creative problem solving. Really engineering is about tinkering and troubleshooting and innovating and coming up with a creative solution. Yeah, I'd I'd agree there. Uh, From a a teacher's perspective, what do you think some of the challenges are for getting kids interested in in STEM? I think the barriers are what I mentioned before, where the perception of self, one's own ability, uh, the perception of what the field is, what engineering is what engineers do, what technicians do, what manufacturing is, is another one. I think there's a lot of misperceptions about manufacturing, Um, but it does come back down to those barriers to opportunity. Um, That might look like a student not being able to get a ride to an after-school program. It might be that they hadn't had lunch that morning and are having a really hard time focusing that day. Um, It might be that that program doesn't exist in their community. How do do we go about combating those things? I know that you you talked about kids kids going hungry. One of the things I'm, I'm kind of passionate about is we have a, a lunch bag program, right? Where we uh, can help kids uh, get food for lunch or bring it home with them or, or what have you, right? Because I agree, if you're hungry, you're not going to be thinking about, you know, how to solve a math problem or your, your how to write a, uh, an essay. Yeah, I think one of the biggest, the biggest thing I would point to that we can do to break down those barriers or help students rise above those barriers is through community partnerships. I think it's about schools working with people in the community like businesses like sel to identify and align the needs of one group and the assets of another group and so one example i would share is we did work this past winter with a boys and girls club and they started a lego robotics program they had won this grant and so they they had the legos they had the the program but they didn't know how to put it together and so they said hey we don't know how to do this can you help us out and so we gathered a team to to launch this program. And in the first day, we'd ask the students, why are you here? Why did you come to this robotics program? And not one of them said engineering. Now, I'm into engineering. It was, I like Legos. It was, my friend is here. It was, oh, I thought it would be cool or it was something to do. And yet across the eight weeks that we worked with them, our technicians, our, the volunteers who had helped out with this program, were able to work with them on building these robots and they flew through it. I mean, it was incredibly inspiring to see these students who did not have any particular passion for engineering thriving with robotics. I mean, it was, it was wild to see it. That's good. That's kind of fun. I got to share a, a, a little bit of a funny story. Ed and I were walking through one of our labs over in, in one of the Zocal buildings where they were testing relays, you know, with high voltage this and in temperature chambers. And as we were walking through, we have a daycare called Little Edison's up there. And they had the, there must have been the, I don't know, the first graders or something like that. We're walking around and getting a tour and seeing all this stuff. And Ed and I stopped by and, you know, there's the kids, there must have been 10 or 10 or 12 of them there. And, you know, just little people having fun, learning about stuff. Our eyes are all big wide and looking at things and Ed's chatting with them. And at one point Ed goes, who wants to be an engineer? Right. And and this little girl didn't miss a beat. She goes, Nobody, right? <laughs> and, then, and then all the kind of look at you. He goes, I mean, everybody uh, just cracked me up, right? So even in here, SEL, our our little Edison Center, we've got probably a a, a little bit to do on the on the marketing side to get uh, kids interested in 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 STEM, whether it's being an engineer for us or going out and solving problems for uh, somebody else. 
You've had a lot of uh, experience uh, working with other teachers throughout the communities, uh, certainly here in this this region, um, and you're a great resource for them. What do you think you could offer up or, or, or tell people to do that that, that might help uh, advance STEM technology throughout the region? What what are something I could do or my my organization might be able to do to, to foster STEM? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it is first reach out to the school, reach out to the nonprofit, might be an educational nonprofit, and offer for your expertise um, as an engineer, offer your time. Um, going back to that the Lego robotics example, the boys and girls club, I think it was more about us just being there week in and week out. The students knew they had somebody to count on somebody they could ask questions to and just be encouraged by. And I would argue that that encouragement is even more powerful than any technical expertise we can bring because what that will build in them is this sense that they can do it. And I think that's the most important thing because with that, then you can go on and achieve anything else. You can learn what you want to learn if you believe that you can do it. The other benefit to connecting with schools, let's say as an engineer or as a finance professional, is that those students get to see role models. They get to see somebody that they can become. And I think that's hugely important to this. Other advice I'd give to to companies or educators is more hands-on activities. When we ask students in surveys how we could improve an activity or an event, they say more hands-on. And then we go through, we revamp our activities, we make it more hands-on. We give them another survey. Say, how could we improve? They say, more (laughs) hands-on. I swear, we have not yet got to a point where they said, we need less hands-on. So I think more and more opportunities for them to actually work with authentic, real problems. And and companies like ours can provide that. We can give real-world problems for them to solve and then let them go for it. I, I totally get that. One of the reasons I chose WSU to to go to college at is because they had so much labs that was associated with the the classwork. And and I'm one of those people, the personality where I have to be in the lab to test it and play with it, blow it up a couple of times before I really understand how how something works. So I, I think you're spot on, right? The more hands on you have, I think that the the more tangible and real the the experience is it probably stays with you more too right it gets really embedded in your in your brain um i'm a, i'm an engineer so i love to measure everything whether it's how fast a protective element works in one of our relays to measuring how well the business on hell i even measure every round of golf how far my drives went right to see if i'm getting farther or or uh or shorter and most of the time it feels like it's getting shorter on my golf game but that's another whole story i guess our podcast we could have um but Along those lines with measuring stuff, right? How do we measure the impact of what we're doing on K through 12? And and I don't have the time to wait till a kindergartner graduates from college to to, to know if we're, we're making progress. So what are your thoughts on how do we know if we're doing a good job or headed headed in the right direction when it comes to STEM education? I'll, I'll start with the bad news. And, and part of that is that it's so difficult to entangle the impact on a on a student that we might have in STEM programming, right? Because of all these other factors, like what neighborhood they grew up in, what socioeconomic, socioeconomic status is. Um, was it this particular, te- was it a string of really great teachers, a string of really bad teachers? Was it that one field trip I took that one time to SEL? We can't know on on the broader scale, but how we do measure it, uh, we, we use a number of different measurements. So we conduct surveys, we track requests, we track Uh, volunteer hours. We track the quality of our programming. So in one sense, the market, you think about the market demand, we know that we're having impact because there's a demand for partnering with SEL and a number of different programs. And I think that's really encouraging. One other piece of it too, is we know that opportunities correlate with achievement. Mm -hmm. So the more opportunities we can provide, the bigger impact on achievement we'll have. So we won't get to see a one for one, you know, on, on our particular role, I don't think, but knowing that the more quality opportunities we create, that that will lead to more achievement down the, down the road. Yeah, I think that's certainly in the, in the short term, it's, it, it's a tough problem. How do you measure this exactly to see if, if you're getting a, uh, the desired outcome that you're, you're after? Um, maybe, maybe I take it a, another way. If we get one, two, three, or four, four folks out of all the, the, the different kids that you've touched over, over the years that, that convert to STEM, some STEM type of uh, vocation going forward, I think we've succeeded, right? It's, it's a tough problem. If we don't do anything, we're never going to fill our STEM needs. So, you know, that putting out the effort, all that, that you do in your team to 
help kids discover the I, I think that the the wonder of of STEM is uh, it's it's a great it's a great thing to be doing right, and I I can only imagine you know. Be, being in your shoes, seeing kids light up for the first time when they can connect the dots and they build something, whether it's the the Lego machines or or some other activity, that's got to be very very fulfilling work. Yeah, and and again, that's where I, that's where my hope comes from is seeing those moments, and especially with the students who had no interest or no care for STEM or engineering to go in for let's say like an at this hour of code event. A number of our um, software engineers had gone to this school, and we worked with grades think first through fifth grade. And at the end of that hour, they were saying, when can you come back? Or can I go home and, and do more coding? In working with this entire elementary school, it felt like every kid was excited about what they were doing. And that's what gives me hope is we're not just talking about the student who has a natural inclination for tinkering with a thing. It was all of them. And that key recipe for success was give them a challenge, let them run with it, support them, and encourage them. Yeah. And that that was the recipe. And I think that that can happen again and again and again. I don't think it takes a lot of resource. I don't think it takes a lot of willpower. I think it takes people going out, putting themselves out there, giving it a shot. I came across a, a study that was looking at textbooks, and they're looking at textbooks globally. And of the 50,000 math problems that they found in these textbooks, Around the world, 1% of the problems were challenging real-world problems or asking students to really apply their math knowledge to a problem. And in the U.S., it was 0.5. 0.5% of these questions were about real-world applications. That's one of those things that's mind-blowing. So that's not a solution. It's just like hey, when we when we talk about part of the problems, I think it does come back to that in our education system, there's not enough interfacing between schools and community partners and businesses and industry. Because if there was, what if, I wonder, like, what if SEL, what if, what if you, Dave, wrote 10 questions for a math textbook for fifth grade, where you take your knowledge of mechanical engineering, let's say, and take a, a real problem that you face, but then, but just put it into fifth grade terms. That's what's possible, I believe, in these partnerships that we create and continue to build and improve on. And that's a thing that schools can't do on their own. If you want a real world problem, you've got to go to the source. We had a great visit with a class from Lewiston. They'd come to our Lewiston facility. They'd taken a tour and we pitched them a problem. So this was a pre-engineering class. So these, we, we knew that our target audience here, but we pitched them an actual problem that we were having. And there was a solder bridge issue. And so we simplified it and right sized it for this I think it was a junior and senior level class. And we had them pair off, come up with solutions to this problem and then present back to us. And so they, they did that, presented the solutions. The solution sounded great, but the problem hadn't been solved internally yet. We just created, you know, we just simplified and created this problem for them. And this was maybe just like six months ago. I checked back in with a person who had helped me with this as a process engineer. And I said, Hey, whatever happened to that problem? Um, were the kids even close? And he said, oh yeah, the kids got it. it you know, it was, it was, it was their solution, although simplified that, that became the actual solution. And I think it was maybe a matter of too much solder in one particular place, but, but the, the fact that the kids could take this completely novel problem using the skills they had present on it and have it actually be close to the real answer is incredibly heartening. And it did not take a ton of effort. It was merely the alignment of opportunity on the school side with the resource we had on the on the community or the industry side. Yeah, we often make a joke here at SEL, right? If we have a really hard problem, we'll give it to an intern because they, <laughs> they, they, they'll they go out and solve it because they don't really know how hard it is to solve, right? That, that's the, kind of the irony of those those situations, right? That the ignorance at some level is bliss and, and, and it can open you up to, to new ideas. And I think that that's exactly what comes back to the, some of the things we were talking about, which if you've got this these preconceived notions about what a thing is or what a thing must be or how a solution must turn out, then you've shut off the creative part of it. And that's why I think that allowing ourselves to be more creative and removing those barriers to how we solve the problem will have a big impact on students and their perception of what they can and yeah. can't do. Yeah, I think you're, you know, 
your enthusiasm and, and and being the example you are. You know, I mentioned on other podcasts that, uh, you know, grow, growing up, I thought for sure I was going to be a lawyer, right? I loved arguing. It seemed like a great vocation. I had a, a fabulous uh, physics teacher my senior year in high school, and that 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 right there tip tip me instead of being a lawyer to become a an electrical engineer right it was because the class was fun it was engaging i saw what done looked like you know if we can replicate that through the work you're doing or even you know stuff we do as as engineers day to day just trying to help somebody else out or or show them what done looks like or or how things work uh maybe we can be that inspiration that tips a, a, another another kid to, to to go into stem as opposed to perhaps doing something else John, thanks very much for the conversation. I, I feel a little bit better after talking to you that uh, there there is some hope. Probably requires a lot of work on all our our parts to to create more of the the engineers and scientists we need to help build our our society and uh, keep the lights on. So thank you, John, for the conversation. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you for stopping by Schweitzer Drive. Join us again as we learn about, explore, and celebrate electric power. For more information about the show, please visit selinc.com slash Schweitzer Drive.